This is a review of the i to a function. So I just want to go through it line by line to review what happened. So this is the code is posted on the website, and I've got it loaded here in my editor. The first statement we have is global i to a. And what that does is says uh, allows the label i to a to be accessed from other files within the same project. By default, the scope is limited to just this one file. The next line of interest is section.txt, and that indicates that the code that follows should be loaded into the text segment uh, when the program is executed, and that's where all code needs to go. Uh, it's just called the text segment. Then I have the label i to a with a colon. I usually put my labels on a line by themselves for code, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but you can see I formatted it with labels over in the left-hand margin and code uh, a couple tab stops in. Just for readability, the, the assembler doesn't really care. The first instruction um, moves uh, copies RSI over into RAX. RSI is where the first parameter to the function is, is passing, excuse me, the second parameter, which is the value n, and I copy it over into RAX because that's where it needs to be when I do my division instructions. Normally you can pick whatever registers you want, but in the case of the division instruction, the value has to be in RAX. So I copy it over there, and then in the next line, I reuse RSI to be the counter where I, I'm notice, um, I count how long my output is, how many bytes I've written. And I just reused RSI since I've just freed it up by copying its value to RAX. Next we have move R10, uh, the value 10, so that's loading a literal value 10 into the register R10. And again, I'm just setting that up so that I can do my division later. I figured it makes sense to just load that value once rather than loading it each time I do a division. I then have a label, and this label, dot loop, has a dot in the front, which means that it's a local label. So this is only valid, the, the scope of this label is, is limited to the i to a function. As soon as I do another normal label, that would reset um, the, the local label uh, group. So the first thing I do is perform a division. So this is inside the main loop where I'm extracting one digit at a time from the number that I want to print. And the digit that I have most easy access to is the least significant digit. So if I was printing the number 478, it's easy to extract the number 8. I just divide by 10 and take the remainder. And that would be uh, 478 divided by 10 would be 47 with a remainder of 8. So that's what I do here. Uh, to do a division, I have to have the number I want to divide into in RAX, and then I have to move a 0 into RDX, which I've done here on line 13. And then on line 14, I perform the division. And note that div, the div instruction, only gives the value you're dividing by. So that's R10, uh, the, which is the number 10 in the register R10 that I loaded earlier. Uh, it's implicit that um, the value I'm dividing into is an RAX. Once the division is finished, I know that the um, division, so in my example of 478, RAX will now contain 47, that's the quotient, uh, with the result truncated, and RDX will have the remainder, which is 8. So that's the number 8. I need to convert that into a digit 8. So that's line 15. I add the digit 0, enclosed in single quotes, to RDX. The assembler converts that single quoted character into its numeric ASCII code and then I add that to RDX. So if RDX was 0, I would have the digit 0. If RDX was 1, I would now have the digit 1, and so forth, because the digits are laid out contiguously in ASCII. So now RDX, uh, the least significant 8 bits of RDX, now contains the ASCII code of a single digit. So my next, next task is to save that in the buffer, to print it to the buffer. So I do a move instruction on line 16, where I take RDI, which is the location of the buffer, I had RSI, which is the number of bytes written so far, and the sum of those gives me the address of the next byte that I should write. By enclosing it in square brackets, I'm telling the instruction that it needs to write that to memory at a memory location defined inside by the, by the address inside the square brackets. And then the source of the move is DL, which is the name for the least significant eight bits of the RDX register. Uh, so that's my single digit. Um, the assembler knows then, or the, knows that because I'm using an 8-bit source, it only needs to store, uh, it's only copying one byte. So it, it just ignores the rest of the RDX register and doesn't override any memory that I don't want overwritten. Having saved that one byte, I now increment RSI on line 17, and that um, 
that just indicates that I've written, uh, again, my bookkeeping for how many bytes I've written, I, I've now written one more byte than I did before, so I increment that counter. Next, I'm checking to see if there are any more digits to extract from the number. So in our example, uh, I have 47 left in RAX, uh, having started with 478. So I compare RAX with zero, and if it's greater than that, if I've still got values left, then I do a, a branch up to dot loop. So that's JG for jump if greater than. So that will go up and continue and keep writing out digits, and then this loop will finish when RAX is zero, when I have kind of no digits left to write. So that works, except that it leaves my string in reverse order. I started with the number 478, the first digit I wrote was an 8, the next one would be a 7, and finally I'd have written a 4. So my next task is to reverse the string, as the comment indicates. So <clears throat> I'm going to use RDX, I don't need it for division anymore, so I'm going to use it now as a pointer to the beginning of the string that needs to be reversed. So it's going to contain that address, and I do that, I initialize it by copying RDI into it. Then I need to uh, set RCX, I just picked it as another available register, is going to be the address of the last digit that needs to be reversed. And my strategy is to reverse two digits, then I'll increment RDX, decrement RCX, and repeat, and continue doing that until uh, RDX, the pointer to the beginning of the string to reverse, is greater than or equal to RCX, the address of the last character that needs reversing. I've used the LEA instruction here, which is short for load effective address. So I'm loading into RCX uh, this expression in square brackets. And what LEA does is it you, it, you do it just like a move instruction, but instead of going and computing an address and going fetching the value from memory at that address, <clears throat> it copies the address itself. So here, uh, this is just a, a neat little trick that lets me do, in this case, a couple of additions uh, at once. Or I, I can add two registers together, RDI plus RI, or RSI, and I can subtract one. So RDI is the address of the buffer, RSA, RSI is the number of bytes that I've written, uh, so RDI plus RSI would be the location of the next available byte. I want the location of the last used byte, so I subtract one from it. So it copies that value. It doesn't actually touch memory. It just computes that as though it was an address and copies the address to RCX. Then I jump. I actually skip over the main reverse loop to test if I'm done. So I'm doing the test at the end of the loop instead of the beginning. And the reasoning for that is it allows me to, uh, in my main loop, I'll only have one conditional branch per iteration. And as we've talked about and we'll talk more about, uh, conditional branches can be expensive because of the possibility of misprediction. So they, they can be um, expensive in, in loops. Now, it's not going to make a difference here, we're, uh, but, but it's, it's just kind of a, um, a common trick, I guess, in assembly language. And compilers often do the same thing. So I jump down to reverse test, which is testing to see if I have finished my job. So I compare RDX, the pointer to the beginning of the string, with RCX. And as long as it's still less than the pointer to the end of the string, I branch back up uh, line 36. I have the conditional branch to go back up to reverse loop. So that means I still have work to do. So I set the work up um, after I, I convert the digits, I prepare the reversal, I jump down to see if the reversal is done. Now this would actually happen if I had only written one digit. I wouldn't need to do any reversing. So it is important that I, I actually do that test before I start doing any reversal. Then we, so we branch back up to the reverse loop label on line 26. And here we just go and fetch the first character of the string and the last character of the string. So move AL um, from uh, an address in memory at RDX. So RDX is that pointer. I can close it in square brackets to go and fetch a single byte from that location, and I copy it into AL, the least significant 8 bits of the A register. Then I use AH, which is the next 8 bits, um, to fetch the value from the end of the string, the, the byte from the end of the string. And so the same thing, in, in close in square brackets, I have RCX, so I'm treating it as a pointer. Then having loaded those two values, now I just need to go and store them back to the same two locations, but in reverse order. So I copy AL, the byte that was at the beginning of the string, to the address pointed to by RCX, which points to the end of the string. Then I take uh, AH, which was the byte I got from the end of the string, and I store it to the location, the address pointed to by RDX, which was the pointer to beginning of the string. So I've done a swap. Now I increment RDX and I decrement RDX on lines 31 and 32 respectively, uh, preparing me for the next iteration of the loop 
and then it falls through. Assembly language code or machine language code always just runs in a straight line unless you tell it to do otherwise. So it's going to fall through into the reverse test. Even though I put white space in a label, that doesn't affect the execution of the code. So it's immediately going to compare RDX with RCX again and continue the loop as, more, as long as there's more reversing to do. Finally, once the, it's finished, so once reverse test has, uh, has failed, there's no more reversing to do, I prepare to return from the function. RSI is what I'm supposed to return, the number of bytes that I've written, but the convention is to always have the return value stored in RAX. So I just do a move to copy RSI into RAX and then issue the return instruction, and the function is done. Uh, I'll do another video to show how to use this and how to call a function uh, separately.